This is Jim Williams with the Hurricane City Tropical Update for September 8th, 3 p.m. Here's the graphical tropical weather outlook from the National Hurricane Center. And we had Tropical Storm Ermine make landfall yesterday morning as a 60-mile-an-hour tropical storm near Brownsville, and it's moved due north. It's taken a while to wind down. Finally, it's a remnant low, but it's dumped a lot of rain over Texas. There's some flooding going on in many areas, and this should flood. the flooding should spread over some nearby states over the next 24 to 36 hours. Luckily, this moved inland before it had a chance to really crank up. We had an eye-like feature on this as it made landfall. And if it had gone like this, maybe in the north Texas, it would have been a whole different situation if it went up near the Galveston area. And luckily, it went into south Texas. We also have tropical storm, former tropical storm Gaston, right near Hispaniola. The system is moving off to the west, and you wonder, why is this not developing? Well, when it was over here, it had a lot of dry air mixing in with the system. And it's been tangling with all these islands right now, so it's not going to develop now. But what's going to happen when it gets in the Western Caribbean? Well, again, the models are really not showing much with this. In fact, the tropical models have really backed off on development for this. Uh, GFDL and HWARF don't even really show anything with this system anymore. And it, it has upper-level support. There's no wind shear. There's no dry air. Very warm sea surface temperatures. But what's missing out here is low pressures. You have pressures, not, not necessarily high pressure in the Western Caribbean, but we have 10... 13, 10, 14, 10, 15 millibar pressures out here. That's not really low enough for development, and I think that's why the models have backed off on it. However, usually when you have a system that convection persists for any length of time, it could happen out here near the uh, Cayman Islands. You could see the system really flare up, and if that happens, the pressures could lower, and we could have a tropical depression, but all indications are that this is just going to meander around and not do much at all according to the model data, so, but we'll keep an eye on it just in case. We also have an area here. We're not going to worry too much about that. But all eyes right now are on Tropical Storm Igor in the East Atlantic out near the Cape Verde Islands. And there's a Tropical Storm Watch out for that area, which is pretty unusual. Uh, but it is about 80 miles to the south. And this should move away from the islands. And we'll watch it going into midweek as this could be a threat to the northeastern Caribbean Sea. But early indications are the Caribbean probably is not going to have to deal with this system. But we cannot discount the potential for the United States and I'll get to the scenarios on that in just a minute. Here's the page, uh, the close-up page from the drop-down menu right above the hurricane tracking chart at Hurricane City and you'll see seven hurricanes here in the history that developed in the same exact position out in the East Atlantic and all of these were benchmark hurricanes, in other words very powerful hurricanes, they all left a, a Mark that for years and years in the areas that they hit took a lot of lives and uh, these are only ones that made landfall there's been a lot of systems that developed out in this grid in the at least Atlantic that turned out to sea but these are some of the more memorable hurricanes you had the 28 hurricane that killed thousands in Lake Okeechobee you had the 38 Long Island Express develop out in the same location you had the Category 5 hurricane from 1947, did a number in the Bahamas, and came into my location here in Delray Beach as a Category 4. 1960, Hurricane Donna developed in this area, hit the Florida Keys, went right up the coast of, of the east coast of the United States, did a lot of damage back in 1960. 1985, Hurricane Gloria, this also did a number in the northeast. Hurricane Hugo, 1989, nobody in South Carolina is going to forget that one. Uh, we almost lost a hurricane hunter in that one. And Hurricane Fran in 1996 also developed in this grid out in the East Atlantic and hit uh, near Wilmington, North Carolina. But the worst damage was up in Topsail, North Carolina. Did a lot of damage up there. But while I have the, I want to circle Fran here because uh, most of the model data on these other systems out here was very scarce back in the day in the, in the 80s and stuff. The model data was, there weren't that many models to work with. So we're not going to talk too much about those. But Hurricane Fran. The best performing models on Fran was the GFDL model and the UK Met. And there's a little bit of a difference on the thinking of Igor with both of these models. The GFDL model is indicating this might turn north into the open Atlantic, and the UK Met model is indicating we're going to have a strong Azores high and might push us a little bit further to the west. So, uh, two differences in those models. Uh, they've transformed a lot over the years there's a lot of they're completely different models than they were back in 1996 but I thought I'd pass that along to you and what's also interesting about this page is any one of these well most of these images are clickable and you can see the tracking the uh, actual weather map 
from the time that they decide to make their recurve or head to the west. So you can kind of tell what the weather map, what the weather was doing at that time. And this will come in handy when this gets a little bit further west in the Atlantic. We'll have to see how the weather behaves down the road. But speaking of which, go ahead, let's go ahead and take a look at what the scenarios are with this. First of all, here's the forecast cone of air from the National Hurricane Center. And again, early next week, Category 2 hurricane east of the northern Leeward Islands. All eyes are going to be on this system. Here are the models early on, tightly clustered, just north of due west. GFDL has this up to major hurricane status over here, and that also plays into the future course. That's another reason why the GFDL might be taking this a little bit further out to sea, because when you have a really strong system, it feels the weak, uh, it reaches higher up into the atmosphere, and it's more prone to be grabbed by troughs in the North Atlantic. So let's look at the GFS in 48 hours from now. This is going out to uh, Friday and uh, getting into Saturday here. And we'll see what, uh, here we have Igor out in the East Atlantic. And you'll notice we have a 1025 millibar high out in the East Atlantic. And we have this low up here in Maine. And this is going to work on the ridge a little bit uh, going out about five days from now, which some models are indicating this could find a weakness up here and follow that weakness on the west side of this Bermuda High, uh, or Azores High rather. But what some other, other models are thinking is, uh, such as the UK Met, is that this ridge out here is going to build and this is going to go off to the northeast, not going to have much effect on it at all, and Igor is going to continue to move off to the west-northwest, setting the stage for the next trough, which is over here in the mountain regions of the U.S. That's going to come up and then dip down and break into this high-pressure ridge again, and a cold front should turn this out near Bermuda or east of Bermuda and out to sea. Here's the thing. If that ridge, if that trough does not take this out, then there's going to be a strong ridge of high pressure that's going to build over the northeast, uh, some indications up to 10, 28 millibar high up here. And if that happens, Igor, if it's down in this area here, will be forced toward the United States, and all eyes are going to have to watch this. That would be around the 20th or so of September. So again, we have a long way to watch this develop, but uh, there's a lot of scenarios that could happen here. But uh, it's not, I wouldn't be saying fish storm just yet, even though a strong system is more apt to be pulled north. We'll just have to watch it, and it's a little bit too early to make that call. Here is Igor based on the water vapor image in the East Atlantic, and again, you have that classic figure eight that I like to point out the two blobs of convection with the center in the middle, and these will consolidate together and we'll have a developing system he heading to the west but what you notice in this picture is all the moisture this has to work with out here there's no dry air when when Gaston was out here you see this dry up here up here it was working into the center but this is surrounded by moisture so it's going to probably have a favorable environment to go ahead and develop right now there's a little bit of easterly wind shear over the system but once it gets further west it will be in a more favorable environment now here is the Saharan air layer out in the East Atlantic, and again, notice just a sprinkling of dry air out around this system right now. Compared to Gaston, it was surrounded by dry air. This has the green light to go ahead and fire up, and, and this is going to be a big, uh, more than likely this will be a major hurricane. And again, too soon to tell if this is going to affect land, but we'll have to watch it. And you can keep track of these tropical updates. Uh, I'll do another one either tomorrow or the next day on what will probably be strengthening Igor and maybe even Hurricane Igor in a day or two from now. Uh, we'll be back with another update on Igor. That's it for now. Thank you again for visiting Hurricane City.